Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Second Wednesday at the Mercury Cafe, brought to you by the Colorado Working Families Party and our Revolution Metro Denver. We've got a bit of what you'd call a situation. <laughs> so here's our situation. As some of you know, we had a big event here on Saturday. We had a progressive delegate convention. And we talked about politics for several hours. And our friends at the Mercury assumed we would be tired of doing it. Because they haven't gotten to know us well enough yet. We never get tired of talking about politics and what we're going to do to fix stuff. So they assumed that we weren't going to be here Wednesday. And as you can see, we are definitely, definitely here. So they had a musical act that was going to come in, and I think we had some scheme about if he showed up, we were just going to try to act like we were the opening act, and I think Representative Young was going to try to negotiate a share of the cover charge. I like the way he thinks. He's thinking budget committee. He's, he's on his game. He's tight. It's nice that at least one party understands numbers enough to, to, to do the budget. So here's what democracy looks like, though. Our event is bigger than the musicians. Clap gently. They, they so they're moving the musicians, is my understanding, over to the next room because democracy is bigger than entertainment in this crowd. We're, we're just that we're, that we're that far into this. So, uh, so welcome and thank you all for coming and thank you for getting here early enough to. Uh, to cause the four musicians to have to go to the room next door. Um, I understand that we disrupted legislative proceedings a little bit with this evening's thing. And thank you, Representative Young. Yeah, anything we can do to help. Good. So we're going to go ahead and get started, just in case, in part, they kick us out here in a minute. Um, I don't think they will. I mean, I, I, there are a few people here who occupied the media tents at the Democratic National Convention of Philadelphia. <laughs> If they couldn't get them out of there, brother, they can't get them out of their <laughs> new baby. Our theme tonight is going to be about bipartisanship, about what that should look like, and about what that could look like. As some of you know, we've got Governor Hickenlooper traveling around with the Ohio Republican Kasich. Maybe we're going to do a presidential run. But don't criticize, that's bipartisanship. Michael Bennett, as you know, is voting with the Republicans on the rollback of Don Frank. Don't no boo, it's bipartisanship. <laughs> the state Supreme Court earlier this week ruled that teachers can be put on a leave of absence and just their job can go away and they have no due process rights. And that ruling made just a few people happy, Republicans and Mike Johnson, because he wrote the law that that case was decided. But you can't criticize, that's bipartisanship, right? Whenever they make a deal with the right, they call it bipartisanship. And if you notice, when we progressive Democrats complain about it, they give us a stern talk about unity. <laughs> Where's the unity when you're touring with Governor Kasich? So we're critical of the bad kind of bipartisanship, but one of our guests tonight is my friend Nick Branya, who I know from the Bernie Sanders campaign who's here to talk about his group, the Movement for a People's Party, to look at establishing a, a real progressive possibility, maybe here in Colorado. And I, I think it's important to note that unlike the Unity Party, and despite their name that, that is out there trying to tilt swing districts away from Democrats, the only Republican districts they run in are the ones where it's so safe, they're not messing with any Republicans' chances. They are just targeting our friends like Faith Winter and Tammy Story, who was there on Saturday. Yeah. Those guys, despite their name, they, they, there's very little unity, certainly from a democratic perspective. Nick and his group, I, I feel like they, they, this is the kind of thing that offers us the possibility of reclaiming bipartisanship in a, in a real genuine way. These are fellow progressives who, if their conscience tells them they can't swing with the Democratic Party right now, I get that. I read the news. You know, I get that. And I, the important thing is that we stay in solidarity together as a progressive community. And if these guys do get something up and running, I, I know that we can have some good debates. 
We could have some good faith debates. We could have some compromise that we could all live with. You know, we could show them what bipartisan could be if we do it right. But this is a vivid example of our inside-outside strategy. We always talk about it at the Working Families Party because in addition to the outside movement for a People's Party, we're also very happily and warmly welcoming some Democrats who are running for some statewide offices that I, I think you will all agree are vital for us as progressives. We've got to win those races. So let, let me get on the stick again, just in case they come and throw me out, um, and, and start uh, with Representative Dave Young, who's running for Colorado Treasurer. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Dave Young. I'm a native Colorado and I'm a progressive Democrat running for state treasurer. And I appreciate the comments. I'm going to talk a little bit about bipartisanship because I think that's an important issue. Um, I want to tell you that uh, I taught junior high up in Greeley for about 25 years and um, had a front row seat to the devastation that I see happening now with uh, lack of public school funding. And so I'm working pretty intensely on that. Um, we need to make changes to Tabor and Gallagher in order to get that done. And so uh, later, if you want to stop by, uh, I'll talk to you about Initiative 93 and some work I'm doing in the legislature. But it's, it's really, um, I think, intense because I went around the state earlier uh, in the fall and I had an upfront view of what's happening in schools all around the state. And we've got old buildings that are falling apart. We've got teachers that are overworked and underpaid. And uh, the students are the ones that are paying the price on this. They really are. And um, the legislature's to blame on part of this. They've been sweeping almost a billion dollars out of schools over the last 10 years, year after year, in order to balance the budget. And we can't continue to go down that pathway because we're gonna lose a generation and maybe two if we continue to do that. So uh, I'm running for state treasurer, and I, it's work I've been doing in the legislature, but I'm running for state treasurer because I want to be uh, a leader in making that happen. And the initiative that we're uh, working on is an effort to change Tabor and to change Gallagher, because they collide with each other, and actually make them work better for the state of Colorado and for our students. Um, I was proud to have the opportunity today to go support students that were out marching, the red uh, ribbon that we have. Uh, I was in the 2013 session when we had all the gun bills and very intense and I was proud to have been able to vote and push the needle. Uh, it was very intense. Uh, we had a lot of people in the Capitol every day and people running around in cars honking trying to disrupt what we were doing so it was real refreshing to see the students actually stand up today and come to the Capitol and send a completely different message and that is we, we need to make our schools safe. We don't need to have guns in there to protect. We need to come together as a community and do a better job of, of, of keeping our schools safe. Uh, so I've worked on a lot of different issues. Um, that do a lot of work in Medicaid. Uh, my sister, intellectually and developmentally disabled. And so I'm trying to get our healthcare system to work better. And so there's some reform that we can do in that area, but again, Funding is a big, big issue, and again, Tabor and Gallagher stand in our way of being able to fund effective and accessible health care for everybody. And so that's, a, a, that's also a mission I'm on. I may take a different pathway than some of you, but I think uh, health care is a right, and it's not a privilege for the wealthy few. It is something that we, we all deserve. Uh, how we get there is um, maybe a different pathway than others, but if we all agree on the goal, and it's the same with public schools, if we all agree on the goal, then I think we have a better chance of reaching the goal if we can uh, get that agreement. Um, I'm uh, exploring public banking. Uh, I went to the Rocky Mountain Public Banking Institute session last Friday, listened carefully to what they were talking about. Uh, there was some effort, uh, effort earlier in the session to actually run a bill to see if we could study that. I'm not sure we can get that through the Republican Senate. But I will stand up a task force to actually study this issue um, and, and really make sure that we understand the changes potentially we might have to make in our Colorado Constitution and statutes in order to pull that off. 
There was a great speaker from New Mexico, a social worker that was involved in a public banking effort down there. It really kind of crystallized my thinking on that. And that is, once again, you got to have everybody in agreement with what the goal is of the public bank. And if you can do that, then you reach that goal. Um, I want to talk just a second about bipartisanship. I'm on the uh, Joint Budget Committee for the state. So we managed the $30 billion budget, and it's the fourth year that I've been on it. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the Budget Committee? Let me give you the political makeup. Three Republicans, three Democrats, takes four votes to pass anything on the budget. So if you're listening to the National Dialogue, you probably are thinking we don't even have a budget in the state of Colorado because everything's in paralysis. But just the opposite is the case. We actually have uh, about 95% plus of our votes are 6-0 votes. And so when we're across the street over at the Joint Budget Committee, there's a lot of governing going on. There's a lot of working together because we realize as a, as a committee that if we don't work together, the state of Colorado is not going to move forward. Now, some of the, my colleagues on the Joint Budget Committee, when they go across the street, go way over to the right and start articulating really strange policies that I never hear them talk about when we're working on the Budget Committee. But I think sometimes this concept of, of compromise uh, is different in people's minds. And what I've seen is Sometimes just people have ideas. It doesn't matter whether it's Republican or Democrat, but they have ideas, a skill set that they bring to the table. And if everybody can come together with that goal in mind and work together, bring their skill set, sometimes you actually come out with something that's far beyond what you even envisioned could happen. And so I, I appreciate that you're focusing on this, and maybe we have this deeper conversation about how it really works. Um, but uh, I'm going through, I have a petition over here, but it's for Initiative 93. I'm not going through the petition process, I'm actually going to the State Assembly, and so I would appreciate your support in the State Assembly, and I'm happy to, if we have a question and answer, answer any questions that people might have. What is the petition? So the petition is uh, an effort to actually raise money for public schools. It is um, an effort to change Tabor and Gallagher, make them work together a little bit better. So the change to, to Tabor is introducing a graduated tax. So right now, we have our tax code in the Colorado Constitution. It's a flat tax, 4.63%. And what this uh, initiative does, it says on income tax for those people that are making more than $150,000 of taxable income, their income tax is going to go up a little bit higher, percentage tax. And for those that are making a half million or better, it's going to go up even more. Now, we know the federal government did something recently. Congress did something recently, right? The, um, they passed the tax cut bill. And so the very wealthy are actually going to get a break. And so what this, is, this does is it sweeps that uh, break into our public schools. 92% of the income taxpayers are not going to see any increase at all. This is the top 8% are going to see an increase. And there's an increase for income tax for corporations as well in there. And so this is, and we know the tax cut actually made that change as well, and they're benefiting from a break. And so this is an effort to fund this. We have a $6.7 billion hole in K-12 education, public schools right now. And that's after a decade after the uh, recession, and we haven't been able to fill it up. And the reason we haven't been able to fill it up is because of Tabor and Gallagher. So I think this is an effort to actually show that we can change Tabor and Gallagher and actually achieve an outcome we can all agree is important, and that is improve our schools, make sure that we have uh, uh, competitively paid and very effective teachers in front of every uh, student in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the state. I'm working in the legislature with a companion bill that goes with that initiative, and it actually distributes the money more equitably uh, and the superintendents came up with that. It wasn't my idea. And, uh, superintendents across the state, there's 178 superintendents, and 174 of them are in complete and full support of this program to, to change the way we distribute it. And I call it a student-centered distribution formula because it actually provides the real funding that students need in order to reach their full potential. And we don't just parse it out and hope it works. They've actually sat down and done the research to ensure that we have the right formula that's actually going to help move students forward. But we can't do it with existing funding. And so 
uh, Initiative 93 is an effort to get that done. Yeah. I have a question. Um, you're in the finance committee, correct? Well, I'm on the budget committee. Budget, budget committee. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I, I'm chair of appropriations and I'm on the budget committee. Okay. Um, in the time that you've been on that committee, have you ever proposed public banking um, so that um, we could get our money out of Wells Fargo and, um, you know, create a public bank that would help small business? No, I haven't, and I'll, I will tell you that until really recently, I had not really been aware of public banking. Um, but um, again, when I saw that, I got the email from Mike Melio, and I think Faith Winter was uh, thinking about maybe running the bill uh, to, to stand up a task force to, to study it. Uh, that's when I started to connect with them and, and do some research on it. Okay. Can you tell me when that was? Beginning, towards the beginning of the session. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Oh. He's a nice guy. He'll stand here and know. take the questions. Okay. Okay. I'll use it all the time. Thank you. Kick me out. Give me the hook. Yeah. I'll just start playing the piano. It'll be like the Oscars. And then I'll start singing, uh, and then that will end it. Right? So thank you for your time, and I appreciate you all being here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, um, I want to know. Healthcare is a human right. How would you go about implementing it uh, in Colorado? My sister is intellectually developmentally disabled, and so I mentioned earlier that I, I spent a lot of time on Medicaid reform, and uh, there's been this conversation about Medicaid for all. Uh, I backed away a little bit from that because I was uh, protesting with Atlantis to death this summer when we went through the whole repeal and replace thing. Uh, and the reason that I, uh, even beyond the fact that I have personal connection to Medicaid through uh, my sister, because all of her services come through Medicaid, um, you know, I, I, I looked at the bigger picture of people with disabilities and seniors and realized that only 10% of our Medicaid population is actually people, seniors and people with disabilities but they actually consume about 43% of the Medicaid budget. And I don't think most people understand that. Uh, I don't think Sue Birch, our now departed uh, director of the Medicaid agency, HICPUF, in government, uh, understood that, that well. But um, they talk about Medicaid actually being health care, but for seniors and people with disabilities, it's not just that, it is that, but it's also housing, it's transportation, it's employment, it's really all services that they need wrapped around them in order to be successful in life. And so I really was fighting uh, the last seven years to get us to actually think about case management and actually getting people the services they need when they need them. And the, the talking point is if you can do that, um, not only would we get better outcomes for people, whether it just be healthcare or all these other um, services that people need, and in the fact, we might actually get better, uh, and we might save some money in the process as well. That's not the goal, but the goal is better outcomes for people. And I think a lot of times we just undercut all that and we wonder why we keep churning out a lot of money in the system and people aren't getting good outcomes because our focus is completely wrong. So a lot of my effort has been how can we expand Medicaid, make it more effective for people, and use that as a model to actually provide better access and effective access, effective services for people, and, and actually have it be a model so that we have some a, a template to use pragmatically to expand it to everybody. So that's that's the pathway I chose. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. They thought we would get tired of talking about budget processes and, and Medicare on just one day. Come on. How could they have double booked us here? For those of you who just arrived, that we thought we were going to get bumped initially because they had double booked us. They thought that on Saturday we had an event upstairs and that was going to be all we needed. Right? We just we'd settle all the political questions and be done by now. So. Fortunately, you all showed up. We had more people than the musical act that showed up, so we took the room. And now we're talking about budget. 
and, I, and I'm not kidding, because here's another treasurer candidate. This is our friend Bernard Galpin. Thank you, Mike. I know it, it's, it's hard to contain the excitement in the state treasurer's race, right? <laughs> A lot of excitement. My name is Bernard Douthit. I think most of you know me. Uh, you can call me, uh, my family calls me Bernard. And my little sister, I think I've, you've heard me say this, she used to call me Bernard the Nerd. Kind of, kind of, I was way cooler than my sister Claire, by the way. Just so you know, everybody knows. But uh, it kind of fits a treasure. We need a treasure who's a, a bit of a nerdy guy, a finance guy. I uh, often hear a lot of people uh, mentioning that they are progressives, I think that's interesting. Uh, uh, what I would say is what makes a progressive? I'd say a progressive is somebody who has a long and proven track record in advocating for universal health care. That is what I have done. Uh, I have been listed as a champion, a champion by the Colorado Foundation for Universal Health Care. A champion. Uh, I, thank you. Uh, in addition to that, I have come out, I don't, I think a progressive will, will fight and get off the sidelines and will get on the front lines and fight for things that they believe in. I believe that the I-70 ditch is a big mistake. Yes. I don't need to look at any more numbers to know that, what I already know, that in Boston, the big dig went five times over budget. And this is 20 lanes through a super fun site, right? We don't, we don't need it. Uh, in addition, we don't need the Olympics. No. no. We don't need our leaders focusing on the Olympics when we've got school teachers that may go on strike, that uh, we've got an affordable housing crisis, and, and a, a healthcare system that is, is frankly, it is cruel and unjust. I have gone without health insurance myself. I'm self-employed. I've gone out with these, so this is a very personal issue for me. I also own a business and have started a business in tough times. And having to finance a business with credit cards and savings and sometimes with retirement is hard. That's why months ago, uh, basically the beginning of this campaign, I advocated for, for a public bank for Colorado. We need a public bank. So People will say they are progressives, but I would hope you would look at their track record and whether or not they've supported universal health care, whether they've supported public banking, uh, and what they've done over, over a long period of time. Now, one of the things that always strikes out, just look what I think about, is we have not elected as treasurer, a Democratic treasurer, in 25 years. 25 years. We've, oh, we've elected one, I should say, one. Kerry Kennedy. Uh, and I think this has been one of the key things that has held us back in not being able to fix para, not being able to fix Tabor, not being able to do a lot of things that we need to do. Um, but I think it is essential, of course, that we elect a tre treasurer who's got a who's got the background in business and who's got a finance background to work with our next governor and sometimes even push our next governor to make the changes we need to make because it's going to take a village. It's going to take a lot to make the changes happen. It's not going to. We've had a democratic governor. And we haven't had, we, we've, and we, frankly, we've had Tabor for 25 years, and we haven't been able to get around it. So I believe that with my background, that I'm the most qualified, the most experienced, the most independent candidate. Many of you heard me, have heard me talk about this. I am not taking corporate money. I am financing this campaign um, in, a, in a grassroots way. I should have to write to my card, get some envelopes. So I think you need to talk to some of you folks about some donations. Um, and you know, it's it's a it's a critical time here. We we've got really, as I think about it, it's I said to I said to somebody today, can I use the word cruel when we're talking about the status quo? Yeah. Yeah. I think we can. Yeah. I've got a partner. If you've heard, maybe you've heard me talk about this. She teaches in a classroom that in September was over ninety degrees for most of September, 90 degrees, not 80 degrees, 90 degrees for most of September. And I frankly think that it is just, it has been a, I just got tired of waiting. I got tired of waiting for our legislature and other people to make changes. So that's why I'm in this race. I've got a, a background in finance and economics. So as treasurer, I want to do four things real quick. One, most of you've heard me talk about this. The state's got about $3 billion with Wells Fargo. Boo, boo, right? 
We want to move that money out of Wells Fargo into a state-based bank or credit union. Secondly, uh, I want to find a long-term fix for para. My mom is in para. I've got other family members in para. It is critical that we fix it. It, it could, if we don't, and the and we can blame Republicans that were for decisions that were made 15 years ago. But there have been a lot of bad decisions made more recently. And when I look at this in a sober kind of way, the board hasn't really done that great of a job. But we also need to protect and make sure that the board, if we, if we, and I think we need to make some changes. We don't want to allow Governor Tom Tancredo to appoint anybody. But there are some ways to fix that. South Dakota has a great model. I'd be happy to go into more detail about that. Uh, but we need to fix Tabor. It's, it's just hasn't been getting any better even over the last three or four years. Um, and then thirdly, we need a public bank in Colorado. I already mentioned that. Of course, for, and for the marijuana industry, this is huge. I mean, everybody knows this. We need it. it, it my, my estimates, it would bring $200 million to the state of Colorado. Michigan, just three weeks ago, passed a bill to create a public bank. Phil Murphy's pushing to create one in, yeah, to create one in New Jersey. I, you know, maybe because I have a background in finance and economics, I understand that when, what? We're having a little fun. When I understand, we're earning 1.1% on our money. Denver's going out and borrowing in the bond market at 4 and 5%. 4 and 5% is more than 1%. We could be loaning money to ourselves. To me, I don't need to, this is something I don't need to study. It's pretty simple. The math is, the math works. And then lastly, to make healthcare happen in Colorado, I think what we're going to, see happen is a multi-state solution where, the, where California, Oregon, uh, Washington, where we all get together and we all push for a single-payer solution out here out west. I campaigned for Amendment 69 and one of the reasons why it was defeated was of course Walker Stapleton went out and misled voters. He told voters that it was a $25 billion tax increase, but he forgot to tell them that we were going to save $30 billion. And so what we need, I believe, and one of the main reasons why I'm running is because we need a treasurer who's got a business background, a finance background, and who's gone without health care, who will go out to the public and who will say, when, when this comes up, this is something we want to do. You can trust me. You can trust, you can trust the decisions that we're going to make on this, and we're going to make it happen. So I'm running for state treasurer. I'm going through the caucus and assembly process. I'm not petitioning on, thankfully. Looks like a lot of work. A lot of, a lot of very expensive, but about $350,000 or $200,000. Uh, yeah, you can't write a check, no. If any of you are going to be delegates uh, at county assemblies and going on state, I, I need your help. Um, again, my name is Bernard Douthit. You can find more information about me, most of you already know me, at BernieForTreasure.com. Thank you very much. Any questions? There, there are a lot of moving parts in this. I've studied it in great detail. Um, I would, I would certainly recommend we change that because that creates a bias against somebody like you, a bias for somebody that I've, I've worked on contract as well, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, frankly, one of the things that that comes to mind for me is that in Colorado, we take and this is just as an aside. I think we can find money in other places so that we don't have to do this. Uh, like I was just mentioning, Wyoming takes the exact same amount of oil and gas out of the ground as we do here in Colorado. The exact same. And yet, their government 
their state government receives $500 million more in tax revenue. And so what I would want to do is, let's go there first, instead, before we start punishing people like you uh, who want to work. So that's that's what I would advocate. And there's some other, there are other places too. Uh, other, other questions? Thomas. Yes, compared to divest from oil and gas, our uh, retirement funds go to frack and ruin our water and air, our own state? I would, but one of the things that I don't want to overpromise. Uh, the treasurer has a seat on the para board and a seat on, I think, on the investment advisory board, and I certainly would absolutely take that. Absolutely, uh, but you know, it's gonna. We'd have to get other people in agreement. I, I think we should. We should be able to. Absolutely, it makes total sense. Question over um, back over here. It's, it's tough. I think. Well, there's, there's, you know, there's a couple. I think, I think we can think outside the box. I mean, I can go. I mean, I, how much time do we have? I could, I could talk about it. I mean, one of the things, frankly, that I suggested to Ivan Miller, who's the head of the Foundation for Universal Healthcare, is we have a hundred thousand state employees in Colorado, and then we go and we buy our healthcare from Kaiser. Why, why don't? I mean, why can't we just, that's a hundred thousand, why can't we just, to me, like, let's start thinking outside the box. Um, I think I will look for money, and then, and of course, a public bank would provide other money. I think the, the fact is that there were, Parrot was fully funded about 17 years ago. It's, it's and, and really, if, if you've read my op-ed on this, from my perspective, what I think it really amounts to is the fact that we haven't haven't had the courage to fix Tabor and to give teachers, in particular, but state employees, raises when we really needed to. So what did the what did the legislature do? Some people in the legislature, they promised benefits, but they didn't fund them correctly. And I think to backtrack on that, to, for people who've put time in, who've counted on this stuff. I, that's something we cannot do. So it's really a rock and a hard place that we're in. Um, but again, I, I am not. I haven't been impressed with the way that, that even in the last five years, uh, we can only blame the Republicans and Bill Owens for so much stuff. Um, we, seriously, what I would do, of course, is look for money in other ways. I, but I think it, it's somewhat unavoidable to raise the. We're going to have to raise the um, employer portion a little bit to make to make this plan fully funded. And to not only live up to our obligations, I mean that that's and that's key, but also, frankly, to keep our states bond rating and to keep the state solvent. Um, but but again, I think there's there are a lot of things we can do, and this is why I think you know new new people, new blood, we could go in and say, what well, I would, let's go, let's go take 100,000 employees and go create our own health care plan and see how much money we can save, because I bet you we can save some money that way. A lot of other things we can do. Sorry, I, I over my time. Thank you very much. know how much Bernard Galvin likes to talk about <laughs> He wasn't kidding when he said he would stay all night. <laughs> I can't have that because our, our next speaker, one of my one of my new favorites, I think, Ms. Jenna Griswold is running for Secretary of State and I think it's worth recognizing that Jenna has gone out of her way for, I think it's been months now, right, that she's been looking for an opportunity to come speak to this community. And as you know, not every candidate takes this community that seriously. So she appreciates all of you, and I hope you'll show her that you appreciate her. My name's Jenna Griswold, and I'm running for Secretary of State. But why I wanted to come is to sing some karaoke here. Um, no, my, my town of Estes Park almost banned me from singing karaoke, so I won't do that. Uh, I'm running for Secretary of State for some pretty simple reasons. Protect our voting rights and bolster cybersecurity in our elections. To make sure after the next census that we're redistricting fairly. There is no place for gerrymandering here. 
and then also to pass transparency measures to stop the floodgates of dark money that are coming into our elections. Yes. Uh, now, I grew up very working class in Estes Park. My mom, she worked two plus jobs and we would sometimes still have to go to food banks growing up. Uh, and you know, I started working really young, right after seventh grade, I think I was 11 or 12. Because I, I just saw how hard my mom was working and I wanted to help out the little that I could at the time. Uh, and that really inspired me. I saw how a lot of Colorado families struggled and that our situation was by no means unique. Uh, and it inspired me to be the first person in my family to go to a four-year college. Uh, and then I went off to law school because I really wanted to help even the playing field for Coloradans. Um, you know, a couple years into my legal practice, I got this great opportunity. And that was to join President Obama's campaign as a voter protection attorney here in Colorado fighting for our voting rights. Uh, do you all remember Scott Gessler? Oh. That's how I learned about our Secretary of State and what that person can do. You know, Secretary of State Gessler was working very hard to disenfranchise people. Uh, and, and we fought even harder to make sure that people had the franchise. Uh, you know, one of the things I did in 2012 was run the voter protection hotline. So voters from all over the state would call whenever they would have problems. And I remember receiving a call. Uh, I speak fluent Spanish from growing up working class in Estes. So I took all the calls in Spanish, or at least 75% at least of them. And a guy from northern Colorado called. He was predominantly a Spanish speaker, had his driver's license, was a U.S. citizen, was going to the right polling place, and was turned away three times. Oh, wow. oh. And we were able to get him to vote, but how many people don't call in? How many people don't have the time or the tenacity, the, the, the pure willpower to go back over and over and over? So that stuck with me. I, you know, I went on, I ran the federal portfolio for the governor, so when the flood hit in 2013, and it hit Estes Park smack on. Uh, you know, I didn't talk to my mom for five days. We didn't know what happened to her. Uh, she was fine, but you guys know that Northern Colorado was not. But I was able to help bring back more than a billion dollars of flood relief. I love serving the state. Um, it was fantastic. But then I wanted to come home and start my own practice in Louisville. Uh, you know, like 2012, very unfortunately, we again have to fight to protect our voting rights. The president formed a voter commission, put Chris Kobach in charge of it, who has a long and ugly history of disenfranchising hundreds of thousands of people around the country. And they started to collect voter data on every person in the nation. Knowing this was part of a coordinated attack on voting rights, nearly every secretary of state, in a bipartisan manner, that's good bipartisanship, came out and said, oh no, 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 this is no good. Only three said, this is a great idea one of which is our current Secretary of State. And when he sent our voter data to DC to the Trump Commission, it caused thousands of Coloradans to cancel their voter registration. This is our civil rights, these are our constitutional rights. And this can affect the entire country because we live in a swing state. You know, Colorado, the, the race for governor has been decided by just a little over 5,000 votes. And there's reports that say more than that have canceled their voter registrations. On top of that, our elections were targeted by Russian cyber attack last presidential election. Uh, and we saw from uh, the Mueller indictment that Russian agents came here to gather intelligence. I'm running for Secretary of State because I think there's things that we have to do to make sure we maintain our democracy. When it comes to attacks on our voting rights, I believe the Colorado way is to bolster those rights. That's, like, that's why I'd like to expand automatic voter registration as fast as we can so that our answer to Trump is, hey, look at how many more eligible Coloradans we have enrolled and voting at the polls. When it comes to cyber attack, we have to bolster our cybersecurity immediately. We cannot wait until we are, we are compromised. We already know we're targeted. So that is a top priority. And when it comes to the dark money we see flooding our elections, I believe we pass transparency measures. That's why I support requiring presidential candidates to release their tax returns to get onto our ballot. Yes. 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 That's why I, report, uh, I support closing the federal loophole that allows entities to buy social media and go totally unreported 
You know, Russia touched 126 million people. We need to close that loophole. And here in Colorado, every dollar spent on a campaign should be reported on a campaign or an issue. It should be reported. We need to know who is trying to influence our elections. It's basic democracy. Uh, and then lastly, there is a ballot initiative that if it passes, puts a tremendous amount of power within the Secretary of State to oversee the process of redistricting and reapportionment. Reapportionment is drawing our local maps, political maps, and redistricting is our congressional. We need to make sure we have someone in there who's going to be nonpartisan, making sure every person has their voice heard, regardless if it's the People's Party, uh, the Democrats, the Republicans, unaffiliated, and everybody. So that's why I'm running. Uh, the campaign is going really well. I have the endorsements of four of our Democratic governor candidates. So Kerry Kennedy, Mike Johnston, Jared Polis, and Noel Ginsburg. I am working really hard to make sure that we win this race and there's a path. So I'm going to ask, I, I really need your help. So if you are going to county assembly, please go all the way to state. I also, I'm not petitioning. I'm, I'm going straight through the caucus process. And I would really like to get onto that primary ballot for us because I know I can win this general election. Uh, if you have time over the next month, an hour, two hours, 40 hours, 60 hours, <laughs> any amount of time to help out the campaign, let me know. I'm going to send out uh, uh, sign-up sheets. We have to make close to 20,000 calls. I would love to have your help. And if you're an introvert, there's so much data. Uh, so there's work for everybody. Uh, and then lastly, you know, we do have to organize this entire, this entire state. So if you have five, ten, all the way up to the limit of $1,150 that you can contribute, please consider doing so. Every dollar helps. That's how it, it's organizing, whether that's your time or money, that's how we win this. And I know we can win a lot of seats in 2018 and get this democracy back on track. So thank you. Thank you. What's that? How are you funded? Are you taking money from Brownstein or Holland and Hart? Uh, so the question was, how am I funded? This is my first race, and uh, like I said, I, I don't have a family to donate a lot of money to me. Uh -huh. uh, the top amount I think that a family member has given me is $150, and it was the first quarter of my campaign and my birthday. Uh, so it's through, it, that's why I'm giving all these gray streaks in, because I do a lot of calls asking people for money. Uh, so I, I don't believe, the only uh, PAC money I've had is from the National Cannabis Industry Association, NCIA. Um, so I, I do take their money. I haven't gotten any other corporate donors. Uh, you know, the Secretary of State's office is not a very transactional office where people want to. Uh, so the average donation right now is $104. I get dollar donations. I get max out donations. And it's just begging people to... But with that said, my first fundraising quarter, I set a record. Highest fundraising ever in Colorado State history for a Secretary of State candidate. Last quarter, I outraised the incumbent four times over. So it's grit. That's how we're raising for this, for this race. Any other questions? Sure. How do you feel about an old paper ballot election so that we're not using machines? Because even though people are filling out the paper ballots, as you know, the machines are still reading it. Yep. So how, how do you feel about getting rid of the machines and doing all paper ballots? So I, I completely agree with all paper ballots with, with some exceptions. For people with disabilities that can't vote a paper ballot, uh, and then I would still like to see a paper receipt, uh, and then military overseas or other situations like that. In best case scenario, you know, at the end of the day, anything that is not a paper ballot or a paper receipt uh, can be compromised. Uh, and then the question is the tabulation machine. So that's the machine that counts the paper ballot. Uh, you know, there's hand, hand counting mm -hmm. is susceptible to erroneous counting. So what I believe we do is paper ballots, use the tabulation machines. You put a number on the ballot so you know where it's at at all times. When Before you do an audit, you put it in a secure place. Then you decide what you're going to audit. And if there's no indication of any type of an attack, you, you probably audit 1% to 5% of, of the votes. Uh, and that audit will tell you whether those tabulation machines were working or not. If there's any risk that they're not, you can go to full recount. What about 
getting a tabulation system for Colorado, if not the rest of the states too, where the tabulation software is owned by us rather than a private entity. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of work right now that I think has to be done, and it's it, it, talk, Bernard just talked about a multi-state solution to healthcare. I think we're going to be seeing a lot of multi-state solutions. Uh, right now, to your point, uh, we can't even see part of the, the code that is used. Exactly. This, it's, it's an issue, right? Uh, at the same time, I am not confident that Colorado has the resources to write our own code for elections, right? Oh, there's a lot of nerds here. I, I, I know there are. But, you know, that's something I really will look into to make sure that we have uh, uh, different ways to ensure that the safest elections in the country. You know, something else we have to consider is the role of the federal government. The federal government has said that our elections are essential infrastructure, so they monitor them for attacks. Last presidential election, when 21 states were under attack, the Department of Homeland Security didn't call the Secretary of State and say, hey, your, your counties are under attack. They didn't call the governor. They called the county clerks. And the problem with that is we have 64 counties with all different types of resources. We have counties in Colorado where the county clerk is only open three days a week. And they have to do the DMV, the elections. They don't have an IT department. Maybe there's an IT person by contract five hours away. And you have Department of Homeland Security calling you and saying, hey, by the way, you're being targeted right now. So there's various things we have to do. I will be a fighter to make sure that the Department of Homeland Security is telling people that are overseeing the entire state, the Secretary of State, that's an overseeing the entire state when we are being targeted, because that will change how we do audits. Uh, and look at other solutions to make sure we do have the securest elections. I, I really think we, we do have relatively good elections in Colorado. There's more we can do, but this is a national security threat, and we need to improve immediately. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Next time, karaoke. <laughs> Oh, Andy Bowie. Okay, I'll get all of them. Very cool. Thank you, Jenna. You can't see the audience very well from out here, so I'm trying to see who else for candidates I've got out. I know I've got David Sedbrook. You're the first I see that qualifies you. Are there any other candidates in the room who I'm not seeing? Either raise your hand now or... Complain to me later. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so David Sedbrook is one of the people who's trying to help us cure our problems in the first and second district oh, of Colorado. So, uh, well, welcome, David Sedbrook. Oh, I, I got to tell you, we had a meeting at, at the Getz office, and when I suggested that as a person who's lived in the district for a couple of decades, Right now, what I'm looking for is who's going to stand with Democrats as opposed to who's going to work across the aisle. Her outreach person outreached across the table just about choked me down, <laughs> like, like many of you have wanted to do in the past. So, so no matter who you might like in the primary, I, I, I think many of us are in agreement that we, we could use some improvement in the first district. Yes. And David, I, I salute you for being one of the people to offer us one of those alternatives. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, hello, I am David Sedbrook. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I am David Sedbrook, and I am running for the Democratic nomination in Congressional District 1. And I wanted to start tonight uh, just in the spirit of this event. I, I actually have been on the phone like all candidates. And I spoke to someone today um, who is not a fan of mine or groups like this, who told me that progressive Democrats are like the Tea Party and that we are going to fragment the Democratic Party. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and she told me, she actually forwarded me an article uh, from August 11th of 2017 that said that the Bernie bros and sisters and progressive Democrats were going to be the greatest gift to the GOP in the coming years. And I read the article, she kept me on the phone the whole time. <laughs> I finally, I told her, I said, 
No offense, but I completely disagree. I think the greatest gift to the GOP is a Democratic Party that adheres to supply-side economics and the philosophies of Ronald Reagan. And I think that this whole idea that progressive Democrats are going to tear down the Democratic Party is ridiculous. We're trying to build this party back up and, and make this party live up to the rhetoric that it's been spewing for years but not living up to. Uh, we've got a party that has turned its back on labor, has adhered to neoliberalism. Uh, we have a party that is selling out to dark money. Um, you know, it, even in this district, I'm sorry, Big Pharma is running the show. And we can see it through the legislation that, that comes out of the Democratic Party lately. And, and this is a real problem. I think we can work across the aisle and be nonpartisan because I've got to be honest, I'm a political nerd. Uh, so I go to a lot of political meetings and I've been going to meetings in Kiowa over the past year. Kiowa. There is not a Democrat in the place. And I'm very fortunate that I'm a, a larger human being, so I'm able to admit that I'm a Democrat when I walk in and nothing happens to me. I wouldn't recommend it. But the truth about these meetings is, is that we're speaking the same language on the streets. Uh, these people are worried about sending their kids to college. They're worried about crony capitalism. They're worried about um, campaign finance reform. They're worried about health care. All the things we're talking about, which should make us realize that what we're really dealing with is a broken political and economic system. And we have people at the top that are perpetuating these breaks in order to ensure their own power continues and the uh, profits of their campaign financiers. That's what we're dealing with. So for me, Progressive Democrats, we have to continue to push forward in order to give this Democratic Party back to the people, give this government back to the people. And for me, my biggest issues are number one, money and politics, because if we don't deal with that, we're not going to deal with any of the issues below. Uh, number two is global warming. We have to start dealing with this. My son is with uh, me tonight. He's such a trooper. We were actually at... Uh, flag football earlier, but um, when I think about global warming, we are really at a place, we're at a tipping point, and we can see it in the ferocity of our storms. We see these, these cold fronts crippling the East Coast in Europe, that's because our polar ice caps are melting. Uh, we have to start dealing with them right now, and I actually read a science journal just recently uh, where this scientist called the Democratic Party functional deniers because we're saying all the right things but we're not doing anything number two is Medicare for all we need it we need to join the rest of the industrialized world and start providing health care to everyone it's a right it's bankrupting us as citizens and it's bankrupting our country period so that needs to happen uh, number three I'm a person who has student debt. I, I pay 8%. I am an indentured servant inside of this society because of these huge student debts. I always joke that I have a really nice Mercedes Benz driving out there that I'm, I'm not driving it, but I'm paying for it. So somebody's <laughs> driving it. We need to deal with this immediately. I believe the quick fix to this would be to um, lower the interest rates down to the same interest rates that we bailed the Wall Street banks out to, which is under 2%. That would be a start uh, and an easy fix. Um, and lastly, I am really concerned here at home that we are experiencing a lot of the inequalities that are occurring across the country. We have unaffordable housing here. When we couple that with unaffordable health care and we look at uh, wages that have largely been stagnant in this community since 2000, we've got a serious problem on our hands. And people my age, there's a new study out that 42% of us will have no money when we retire. This is a serious problem, especially when we have a GOP that wants to take all our safety nets away right now, which is what they're doing by driving up this deficit. They're going to come around and they're going to talk about entitlements 
and they're going to try to take them away. And we are at a tipping point in this society. So I thank you so much uh, for being here. I want to tell you that I am a person who is only taking donations from individuals. There's no corporate money. Obviously, I'm not a corporate candidate in all this. In fact, all of our donations are from people in Colorado. Um, I used to be able to say they were all from CD1, but that is no longer the truth. <laughs> There's a few from outside, so I'd appreciate you guys reaching out to our campaign, uh, talking to me more about the district, um, my vision in the district, and uh, how we can get this Democratic Party back on track. So thank you so much. I was only supposed to have a minute, so I was. Oh, 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 like five oh, oh I oh, thought five it was just a couple minutes. minutes. I, that's, lots of that, that's like a fashion tour. Well, no, 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 no in fairness to my. I, this long event, long I thought, was just for state state races. Anyway, mm -hmm. I apologize. Well, we, we squeezed you. No, thank you. I appreciate it. But So, do you have any ideas how you could raise every working American's wage to a living wage? Yes. And $15 an hour is. Yes, we have to fix Bernie. If he says that one more time, I'm going to scream. $15 yeah. is not a living wage. Yeah. And well, I usually have an adjective before that. Well, but yeah. so, so a living wage where you have some savings. You can pay all your bills like That's your student right. debt. Yeah. You can put some money away for, for retirement. No, no, you're absolutely right. And I think, I think you know, the issue is, is that every single community is different. Obviously, when we look at Denver right now, and we look at the cost of living just to be here, $15 an hour is probably not enough, right? And so we need to raise that. But the other issue that's happened because of just the way the economy is going is we've developed this gig economy, right? Where people are you know, working these 1099 jobs. I think, I just read a, an article that millennials here in this city, it's like 40% of them are involved with the gig economy. And, and I have been in fact too, which is, you know, maybe it's driving for Uber or Lyft or these sort of contract jobs that sort of push the the definition of what should be allowed as a 1099 position. But we do need to raise the minimum wage. And I think Bernie's starting with 15, which in some places does make sense. And that he wants a federal push for that at 15. But you're right, in places like Denver, it's not enough. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing very well. Um, I'm very impressed with you. I'm also uh, very impressed with Ms. Rao. Mm -hmm. And time and time again, we seem to have the problem where we have two excellent, aggressive candidates. Um, if a situation arises where both you and Syra meet the threshold, would you be willing to get together with her so that we don't have, you know, two great candidates? going against this, you know, um, establishment candidate, yeah. and just, just kind of see which which of the two of you might be able to work together to make viability for, for one or the other of you? You know, I'm always open to the conversation, and, and I, we, we speak every time we see each other, and I, I would have no problem sitting down and addressing that. Now, I will say that I am going through assembly period, because I believe to really um, push the Democratic Party and Diana to get that we need to go through the party structures. That's just me. Uh, so I am going through the assembly, and I really want to see how that goes for me, um, because ultimately I, I think that we we I have to make a statement in the assembly process. Um, it's the only way for this really to work out, and that's my thoughts. So after assembly. Sure, I would, I would welcome conversations like that. Hey Dave, uh, just, uh, I agree with a lot of what you said, uh, especially with the uh, difference in both parties. And, uh, and basically, money and politics being, you know, kind of your number one issue. I'm just uh, wondering what you thought as far as how we can get money out of politics within a party that is agreeing to take corporate money. Yeah. I'm just curious on your take on that. Yeah. As far as your shirt, uh, I think it should be modified to our democracy should not. Yes, yes, that's true. 
Uh, it's a great question. I've actually pushed, I think that elected can elected uh, officials should actually have to post on their websites any, in, any um, PAC money or special interest money that they receive. Because what happens is, is, especially when you're dealing in federal races and some of these larger races, it's hard for people to go through a list of donations and really put things together. But when we can compare PAC money and special interest money to someone's voting record, I just think there should be more transparency and we think people should be able to see this more readily. That's my thoughts on that. And I think then you might see some changes because people will be called out to those. Okay, follow up to that. <laughs> yes. How do we know who's in this pack? How do we know who's in the special interest? Well, you know, you know what I mean. That's we need, right. We need to, you know, get down to the uh, individuals. That's right, and then that's the next step. And you're absolutely right about that because some of these packs, and, and a lot of them you have, don't know. well, and they've gotten really fancy. They get these great names that sound great, like yeah. Democrats for Education Reform. It's uh, so yeah. great, it? really. When you when you crack it open, you really see what it's about. So. You never heard of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 The microphone always tells me who the tallest came to. <laughs> I kind of knew early on David wasn't going to be like you or me when I'm going to be at the microphone centers here tonight. When Joe Salazar is here, though, I feel huge. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think that is all the candidates we've got in the room, I believe, and thank you all very much for the concern that you all show for the progressive community and for coming out and, and being with us tonight. We really appreciate that. And how many delegates are there for the Democratic Party nominating process? I'm one of those. How many of you snuck through voting for governor? I don't really care. I'm really going through for Joe Salazar. <laughs> Or somebody like that, yeah? Okay, very good. The plan is working. Yeah. <laughs> the two-step. Awesome. Yeah, it's like the old two-step yeah. in 2016. Yeah. Boy, did I catch hell for that. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you know it's working. <laughs> right. Well, we're going to shift gears now, and I'm going to turn over a good chunk of time. They did come to remind me that there's an open mic poetry slam kind of thing that starts uh, that I'm nowhere near cool enough to participate in, so uh, we'll have to clear it off like by 8.30 or something like that. But uh, I think we've still got plenty of time. If Jen is still here, we may be able to work a song or two in. <laughs> but we're going to shift gears. Um, uh, I'm happy to introduce, uh, he's a friend of mine from back in the Bernie days. Some of you who are national delegates remember we set up a big national slack and had like a thousand of the delegates connected across the country before we went to Philadelphia. That's part of how we caused so much trouble. And uh, Nick was one of the people I was in touch with back then. I found out that Nick was going to be out here for a public banking thing. You just can't get away from the public banking thing. Uh, he was out here for that, and of course I, I grabbed him and said, you got to come talk to Second Wednesday. I think people here would be into it. So I hope you all give a warm welcome to my friend Nick Branya from the Movement for a People's Party. Thanks, everyone, for having me and for inviting me. It is it's great as a uh, as an alum of our revolution, someone who helped found it. It is really awesome to be here among OR and WFP. Uh, and thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me uh, tonight. And so I, I think that uh, I think that most of you guys know who I am. Uh, but I am, um, for those of you who don't, uh, I'm Nick Brana, and I've spent my life kind of trying to study how progressive change uh, happens. And so first, that led me to a decade of working inside the Democratic Party. I worked for Terry McAuliffe, who all of you know probably is. He's, uh, he ran for governor in 2013. He's no friend of progressives. <laughs> uh, one of the biggest fundraisers for, uh, for Hillary Clinton and the Clintons. Um, also worked for uh, John Kerry on his uh, political action committee and on his, uh, his re-election campaign. 
Uh, and that, that led me uh, to Bernie Sanders, uh, because I realized, you know, these it, politics through the establishment of the Democratic Party is, uh, is really not the way to, uh, to achieve change. And so for Bernie, uh, I joined the campaign in the fall of 2015. I was the national political outreach coordinator there. It was my job to lobby the Democratic superdelegates for Bernie, which was a miserable job, as I'm sure most of you guys know. I went to join a radical campaign, and I ended up in the most establishment wing of it, where I had to speak back to, you know, and learn to communicate in their language and, like, not, couldn't talk about policy because I hated to hear about policy. So... <laughs> Um, but that then led me uh, to help found our revolution. Uh, I was the first electoral manager there. Uh, it was a great honor to, uh, to be a part of that. Um, and it makes it an even greater honor to, uh, to speak here tonight. Um, in November of 2016, after the, the horror of the results of the general election after Trump was elected, um, I thought we have a remarkable opportunity now to do something. I really dug through, uh, through, through polling data, Gallup data, all kinds of things, and said, we have this incredible opportunity now to start a new, genuinely progressive party. I wrote this article called Sanders Can Be the Lincoln of Our Times on the Huffington Post. I just thought, you know, I'll, I'll put it out there. I was thinking I was actually not going to be involved in politics for a, lot, for a little while, but I thought, you know, this is really what should happen now. Put the article out there on the Huffington Post. And before I knew it, I got hundreds of messages on Facebook, on email, people telling me, yes, we should do this, it's incredible. You know, people saying, where do I donate? Where do I sign up? And I'm like, hold on a minute. I'm not, a, you know, treating me like an organization. I said, wait a minute, you know? But it made me realize... It should be an organization. It should be a movement. And so I got together with other, some fellow Bernie staffers from the campaign, and as well as some delegates, some super volunteers, some of whom are here in the room tonight, and we founded Draft Bernie for a People's Party. And the reaction to that was incredible as well. We had tens of thousands of people signing up helping us organize across the country. We had uh, Cornell West, a number of Bernie surrogates, who came out in support of us, Roseanne DeMauro, Josh Fox, who all said, yes, this is exactly what should happen. You know, e even more who would tell me privately, yes, I think that's what should happen. You know, just don't, can't, don't feel like I can say it. <laughs> uh, and from there, we invited Bernie to a town hall, uh, hosted the Convergence Conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, and Bernie told us that he still thought the Democratic, you know, he said, gee, I might change my mind, you know, but I still think the Democratic Party can be saved, and that's what I'm committed to right now. But I'm glad that you're building an alternative, and I hope that you keep doing that, because there might very well come a time that that's, that's what we need. And so that's just what we did. We continued became the movement for a people's party, and now we are doing just that. We are carrying on that legacy of the campaign inside the movement for a people's party and organizing across many states, including here in Colorado, where we had our chapter launch on Friday. And thank you to those of you who I see who attended. I'm especially thrilled to be here because we are in the midst of a historic movement towards independent politics. Now, over the past decade and a half, tens of millions of people have left the Democratic and the Republican parties. Party affiliation has gone from about 36% to about 27% for the two parties. Meanwhile, the number of independents has skyrocketed, about 45%. The number of people who are also calling for major third party has also skyrocketed. Now, a record high majority of Americans across the country. At the same time, confidence in institutions has plummeted to record lows. That's Congress, television news, newspapers, big business, banks, 
just a, a full spectrum loss of confidence in the way that our society works, the way that our government works. It is really the loss of the consent of the governed. So the question that I'm here to pose tonight is, against that backdrop, should we as progressives struggle against that historic movement into an independent alternative? Or should we embrace it? Should we instead say, the American people are telling us what it is that they want? As we rack our brains thinking of how is it that we motivate people? How is it that we bring them to the polls? Maybe it's not as complicated as we think. Maybe we should listen to them. When two out of every three Americans now says, let's build a major new party. And we want it to be progressive. You all have seen the issue polls. Down the line. Progressive, the things that Bernie ran on. Independent progressive parties have led progressive change throughout U.S. history. We have them to thank the Populist Party, the Bull Moose Party, the People's Party. We have them to thank for all of the cornerstones of our society that we cherish today. Social Security, the 40-hour work week, child labor laws, the New Deal, abolition, women's suffrage, all of these things were not accomplished just because one of the two parties, the Democrats or Republicans, decided that it needed to happen, or even because there was great pressure inside the two parties, but it was because an alternative arose. And it said to people, that's no longer the only place you have to go. You can come here now. And we believe in those things, so we're genuine about it. And guess what? We're not going to fight you. We're not going to suppress you. We're actually going to nurture you as progressives in those beliefs. We're not going to do everything we can to rig the political system against you to ensure that you don't win. We're going to support you. And the parties then, the Democrats and Republicans, they face a choice. They face, we either change or we're going to get wiped out. We're going to get replaced. And indeed, in the case of the Whigs, they did get replaced. Because they went against their base. When their base had turned against slavery, and the Whig Party elites in 1852 forced through a pro-slavery platform, their base, two years later, organized the Republican Party. And within two years, they had got a crucial foothold in Congress. Within four years, they had essentially replaced the Republican Party and taken the House of Representatives. Within six, they had taken both houses of Congress and they had elected Abraham Lincoln president. Another thing that strikes me uh, as so impressive in this time that we're in is that those trends that I described earlier of people leaving the Democratic and Republican parties, they continue all the way through the 2016 election. And so you would think now that, well, you have Bernie Sanders, most popular politician in the country, who is making a monumental endeavor to bring working people into the Democratic Party. And you have Trump, the most offensive politician in decades, essentially, who should be a force for the same thing, to bring people into the Democratic Party. You would think, wow, the Democratic Party must really be surging now. <laughs> well, I think you all know the answer to that. It's not. The trend has continued. People keep leaving. And so as you think, wow, if people continue to leave the Democratic and Republican parties and become independent in the face of that backdrop, those tremendous forces of Bernie and Trump, what is it going to take? to bring people back in to the Democratic or the Republican Party. So there is a great flourishing of consciousness now that is leading people 
to become independent, that is leading people to unaffiliate, that is leading people to say, I don't stand for this anymore, in terms of the establishment parties. And that is, rather than treating that as a threat, we should treat it as a blessing. Those people are agreeing with us. They're looking to us to build an alternative with them, for them. Let's collaborate. Rather than trying to, <laughs> last year Bernie compared the Democratic Party to the Titanic, to a sinking ship. And perhaps rather than trying to plug the leaks furiously in all directions, the Democratic Party and both parties, Democrats and Republicans, we should instead say, let's build the alternative. Let's build the life rafts. <laughs> Once you let go of the corporate parties, an entire world of possibilities opens up. I mean, we can have inspiring candidates, we can have a revolutionary platform, we can have a party that, that supports rather than opposes, rather than pushes down those candidates. You can build a real community, it can be a movement party where you don't have this separation between those who are trying to push forward policies that help working people and the actual institution, an institution that is designed to be so internally undemocratic that one person is in charge of the budget, that the leadership is not whatsoever elected. Instead, I think that our task is even greater than creating a new party, than, than answering that call from Americans, I think it is to reimagine what a political party can be. And that is to say that a political party needs to be internally democratic. And unless it can be internally democratic, you can never expect it to be externally democratic. It needs to elect its leaders. It needs to have the ability to recall their leaders if they betray their mandate. It needs to actually have say in the platform. And the platform needs to be more than a piece of paper. The Hillary, the Hillary campaign, WikiLeaks emails reveal that they actually laughed at us on the Bernie campaign, and us as progressives, for caring about what was in the platform. But the good news is that we have those models. We know what it takes to build it. We know what it looks like. We have the people. We have the will, we have the strength, we have this revolution that has grown. We have everything that we need to do it to answer that call. I mentioned earlier that there was a majority, large majority of Americans, two-thirds, according to Gallup, that are now calling for a major new party. Well, like all great revolutions in history, young people are leading it. 71% of millennials are calling for a major new party. <laughs> millennials. <laughs> Dur during the 2016 election, the general election, it actually was 91% of millennials who said, I want a major third party option. That's amazing. That is unanimous. And that's the next generation. I mean, that's, that's where we're going. It was 65% of all voters who said that, too. You know who else is leading? Leading the charge? Colorado. <laughs> the poll last October showed that 75% of Democrats and Republicans say, 75% of Coloradans say that Democrats and Republicans care more about serving special interests than the people. It also said 81% of people in Colorado say that the Democrats and Republicans care more about winning elections than getting things done. And it said 85% of people are open to voting for independents, independent candidates. 
again, those numbers are astonishing. If if, if you were in the uh, if you were in the business world, there would have been a new competitor that would have entered this market. Eighty five percent of people are calling for an alternative. Oh my gosh, it's the most lucrative, you know. <laughs> There are some good progressives in the Democratic Party. This room, the candidates who spoke before me, that's, I'm, I'm not contesting that. There are really great people inside the Democratic Party, really progressive Democrats. What I am saying is that some, some of them even get elected. And some of them have gotten elected. They've got, they got elected last year. They've gotten elected for decades before that. That's not what I'm contesting. What I'm contesting is that, despite that, the character of the party has not changed. In fact, it's moved further to the right in lockstep with the Republicans, often assisting the Republicans. And even more so, and more importantly, the character of the country has not changed politically, despite those things. To give you another example, in the 1950s, we were at 35% workforce unionization in the United States. 35%. That is, a, that is a, an organizing base that is completely unheard of today. There, there is no organizing base like that in the United States today. That is tens of millions of people involved in the labor movement. They could not redirect the Democratic Party. They couldn't redirect it around progressive issues. Let, they couldn't even redirect it to for self-preservation of the unions themselves. So, sisters and brothers, I'm here to say that this revolution is really us declaring our independence from the corporate parties entirely. Declaring our independence from their policies that are destroying the planet, from their dark money, from their rigged primaries, from their school to prison pipeline, from their support of undermining Wall Street regulations, what little remains of Dodd Frank ahead of the next recession, so that they can repeat the policies that their former president, Bill Clinton, brought in when he dismantled the protections in the financial industry to begin with that led to the Great Recession, declaring our independence from all of that. We need a party of our own, one where we can grow, one that internally reflects our values as well as externally, one in which the donors are not a remote group to the constituents. In any political party, the real constituents are the donors. And if the donors are separate from the people, they're going to represent the donors. The only way to have a party that, that is a true people's party is to have a party in which the donors and the people are the same. With public funding, thank you. Or small dollar donations. With that, I really want to thank you all for inviting me here to speak to you tonight, for entertaining a different perspective for those of you who, who might not be convinced, and I really hope to work with you guys going forward. close to running out of our time here to be dominating the room. But, uh, Nick is going to be sticking around with some of his team back there in the back, and I encourage everybody to go by and say hello and, and be friendly. If you've got questions about what they're up to, I suspect you can get some answers. Uh, I want to recognize Randy. Uh, Randy was a part of our Bernie Sanders crowd from the very beginning. And it's now, 
one of the big wigs in Nick's organization. I'm very proud of her. Glad to see you again, Randy. So we're going to get out of here right quick and help the other folks set up as soon as, because it wouldn't be an official event. Morgan Waters, I promised, I promised you two minutes and I can only give you one. So Morgan Waters, come on down. You're the next contestant on the second Wednesday event because there's always room for a little love for Joe Salazar, right? Yeah. Awesome. So uh, I am not a candidate, so I will make it quick and keep within my time frame. Uh, so Joe can't be here tonight because he's actually fighting for us down at the Capitol right yes. now. Damn right. He is. Uh, well, he's going to be there until about midnight, uh, holding the hearings on the Right to Rest bill, which we have run time and time again. And we might actually be able to pass it this year. So I'm here to talk to you on behalf of Joe. Um, we, uh, we did a great job at caucus on March 6th. We had overwhelming support for Joe across the state. And so thank you all who showed up to support Joe. Who here in this room is a delegate? Awesome. So uh, who else here in this room has three free hours in the next 10 days to make sure that Joe not only makes the ballot, but dominates state assembly on April 14th? <laughs> all right, I got a couple volunteers here. So uh, if you can come find me in the back, I'm actually signing up some folks to help us call delegates. A lot of candidates are just focusing on Denver, Boulder, Jeffco. We all know Joe. We know Joe represents every single Coloradan. And so we are reaching out to the delegates in, you know, in La Jara, in Sterling. We're calling delegates down in Baca County. There are nine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if you can come sign up with me in the back, uh, we are making calls to every single person before their county assembly to make sure they know that Joe is fighting for us and that we need to fight for him at assembly. So come find me right back there. Cool, thank you all very much for coming out and helping us outnumber the music groupies, at least for a little while. <laughs> um, really appreciate you all coming. Nick, really good, good and glad to have you out here in Colorado. I hope we keep fundamentally in this direction out here so it becomes a more attractive spot and you come back and visit us on the regular. Thank you again to the candidates who came out to speak to us. I hope everybody appreciates how much it means that candidates want to call themselves progressive. They want to come here and talk to progressives. But we're already beginning to change the equation. And we're already starting to win, and that's all on you. Thank you all for being here again. We'll see you next month on the second Wednesday. And thanks again to the Mercury Cafe for letting us take over the room.